I saw that what martial arts fundamentally does is not really teach kicking and punching. You teach kicking and punching as a vehicle to impart the most important lessons, and that's character. How's it going? You're listening to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 496, with today's guest, Kyoshi Brian Hayes. I'm Jeremy Lesniak, host for the show, founder here at Whistlekick, and everything we do at Whistlekick is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you want to know more about what we do, check out whistlekick.com. That's the place to learn about our projects and our products. It's also the easiest way to find what you can do to support us, like making a purchase. Using the code PODCAST15 saves you 15% and lets us know that people who listen to this show are willing to put up some money and support it. The show itself gets its own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We release two brand new shows every week, sometimes more. And why do we do what we do? Well, we're working hard to connect, educate, and entertain the traditional martial artists in the world. If you want to help the show and the work that we do here at Whistlekick, there are lots of ways you can do that. You can make a purchase. You could share an episode with a friend. You could follow us on social media. We're at Whistlekick. You could tell a friend about what we're doing, what we got going on. You could pick up a book at Amazon, and we're constantly adding new titles. You can leave us a review on Facebook or Google or Amazon, or wherever else seems to make sense, or support our Patreon. Patreon.com slash Whistlekick. That's a place where we post exclusive content for the people who contribute. And if you give us at least five bucks a month, you'll get access to that. Today, we have another great guest from the land down under, yes, Australia. I had a great conversation with Kyoshi. And we talked about everything from surfing to martial arts to his family. And it was a great talk. And I hope you enjoy it. So here we go. How are you? Oh, well, it's 6 a.m. over here, so the sun yeah. hasn't come up yet. Yeah, you're, doing <laughs> the, you're doing this early. I appreciate that. Oh, I don't mind. I don't mind. I have a workshop I'm doing in an hour and a half, so it's, uh, it's not bad to be up early. What kind of a workshop? Oh, I teach uh, resilience workshops for uh, teachers. And oh. uh, so we have, uh, yeah, using sort of martial arts-based exercises and uh, running it into a fantastic um, social and emotional development um, uh, concept. And I, I teach teachers here in New South Wales and, uh, and around the country as well. And uh, it's just a, a fantastic program, especially when with a rise of anxiety and the mm. pandemic, if you like, if I can use that word of anxiety that we've got, it's a really well-placed program. That's really interesting. I haven't heard anybody doing anything like that. How long have you been running? Well, in about, I was a school teacher and um, my thing was boys' education. And uh, I came across this guy at a national conference for boys here in Australia. And there's a guy from the Netherlands who was um, talking about the connection between body, mind and heart. And I thought, oh, gosh, these are things I've been thinking about forever, but didn't think I had permission, you know, to, to teach. And uh, intuitive truths, if you like, about the way we are first and foremost in our bodies, and then that informs the way that we think and the way that we feel. And I thought, oh boy, this guy has got it the right way. And martial arts artists everywhere understand this. And I went to his workshop and thought, oh boy, if I'd written a book, it would have been this one. So you know, you have to make a decision sometimes in life. Do you do you do your own thing or get on board with somebody who's doing it better than you? And so I thought, well, I'll get on board this. And I've been doing it ever since. And finally, I left teaching actually to pursue this as well as our full-time martial arts center that became five centers <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, and never went back to teaching. So I do about oh, wow. 25, I do about 25 workshops a year. So I'm away from home and my family about 80 days a year, maybe more. Um, teaching teachers and um, counsellors, uh, psychologists, juvenile justice workers, um, how to deliver this program to children, which has become more than children. It's become children, families. I do it with the Air Force and the aged care industry. Um, it's just become a fantastic program um, because everybody worldwide, I think, understands that we have a, I'll use that word again, a pandemic of anxiety and uh, and it really needs to be addressed. Mm. Completely agree. And I've been pretty open on this show that anxiety is something that I deal with. Uh, and, and I won't even temper it and say from time to time, it's something that's been a challenge for me for most of my life. So I think it's great that you're addressing that and bringing in 
these things that I think we all know can be so beneficial with regard to martial arts. But what I'm wondering is, you know, I don't want you to give away all the magic sauce here. I don't want you to, you know, give it away in a sense that that other people might be able to latch on and, and do their own thing. But can you give an example of something that you work with these non-martial artists on that those of us who are martial artists might understand? Well, here's the thing, and then the secret, I guess, I guess it's a bit of a long-winded answer, but it occurred to me a long time ago that if I want to be successful as a martial arts teacher, you know, I was a very serious competitor for years and years, did 15 years of competition at a pretty high level. And uh, when I stopped competing, I thought, well, what's in it for everybody else? And I realised that the mums and the dads and the kids with autism and ADHD and ODD and you name it would benefit at least as much and more, I guess, than the able kids and uh, because a lot of them weren't travelling very well. And I saw that what martial arts fundamentally does is not really teach kicking and punching. You teach kicking and punching as a, a vehicle to impart the most important lessons, and that's character. That's focus and self-control and self-esteem and, you know, regard for others and a sense of your own potential. So it's, um, it's social and emotional development. And when I guess I realised that with some kind of a, I don't know, a slow-growing epiphany, and I thought we need to share this with anybody so what if i took what martial arts does and that is we play and we, we we play kicking and punching and we take care of each other in a nice safe environment what if i could take those exercises those simple play games if you like and try to extract meaningful lessons from them and that's what we do in a program that we call rock and water and rock means you know rock means taking a hard approach if you like and water means letting it go, taking a softer approach. You know, martial arts can be either, you know, go or do or yin or yang or hard or soft. And so we, we simplify the exercises so that non-martial artists, artists can do it. So we teach simple blocking exercises and then, uh, you know, the simple play, simple wrestling, uh, pushing hands, sticking hands. Uh, we call it Chinese boxing, tapping hands, if you like. And then say, so what does this mean? Well, I feel this in my body or I feel that in my body. And if I feel that in my body, how does that relate to my cognitive process and also my emotional processes? And that's the secret. And there are lots of martial arts teachers, the great martial arts teachers that totally get that. I'll say Dave Kovar is one of them, who I think you've interviewed, that, yes. go, that go, let's have lots of games that have really simple lessons about, about resilience or anti-fragility or something like that. Now, if we could put all that into a fantastic package, now you've got a character development program. And the interesting thing, Jeremy, is I'll do a simple game like tapping hands. We call it Chinese boxing. Um, and uh, it's a very popular game. But you know what? I'll do it with three-year-olds and I'll do it with coal miners. And they all laugh, play, <laughs> and then look thoughtful at me, at me when I say, what does this mean? And go, well, it means I'm uptight or it means I feel tension in my legs, or it means I'm not balanced in my body, or I'm too much rock because I just can't win this game, uh, and so forth. And then we start talking about what that means in terms of your own development. So, you know, it's, it's fascinating and interesting and really easy, and I think there are probably lots of programs that do it, but getting the package right is the, is the thing. And, uh, you know, the, the program has gone berserk worldwide there are about seventy thousand, about seventy thousand teachers that are teaching this program it's just not big in the states and it's probably something to do with the educational system i think in the u.s and maybe the way that providers want to roll out their programs they might might you know sort of jealously hoard what they're doing i don't know but you know it's been fairly strong really strong in the netherlands and australia and in europe and in great britain and in canada and probably less in the u.s maybe there are lots yeah. of programs like that i don't know there are and that's why i'm intrigued you know obviously we're we're based here in the u.s so my knowledge of what's going on in the martial arts world is very u.s centric which is part of why i like having people on from all over the world you know you're talking about things that are new to me and that, and that's awesome and this idea of a program makes makes total sense there's a word though that you've used a couple times that I kind of want to unpack because I suspect it's intentional and that's play yes indeed. here we are close to 500 episodes i don't know that anyone has used the verb play in the context of martial arts and it was funny the first moment you used it i had a little bit of a reaction 
what kind of reaction did you have? A, a little bit of a, a, I felt a little defensive for a moment. And, and, and I took a step back as, you know, I, I don't get those reactions too often. And, and of course, when I do, I, there are an opportunity to say, okay, there, there's something here to learn. And I'm wondering, you know, I'm going to guess some of the other listeners might have heard that word. It might have hit their ear a little differently as well. So you already confirmed you use that word intentionally. Can you tell us some more? Well, it occurs to me, look, I'm 62 in three days, Jeremy. So I've been doing martial arts for a very long time, for, you know, over, well over 40 years and teaching it for nearly as, as long. And I thought, why would I want to do this for so long if it wasn't fun? And uh, I have to say, at the age of 50, I took up, I'm at seventh degree black belt in my style, and uh, we can talk about that later. But, <clears throat> you know, I, I took up Brazilian jiu-jitsu at the age of 50, well, why would I want to do that and have 110 kilo, 21 year old sitting on the chest? If it wasn't, if it wasn't fun, and and it is, there's a big difference. You know, I think we have to be careful about this. We take ourselves so seriously and our art so seriously, but if it wasn't fun, we we probably wouldn't do it for as long. So when I when I do martial arts, I still think increasingly I think let's go play martial arts because it is. If um, you know, I, I'm learning to defend myself against what, if you like. That is, uh, I'll give you an example. If I was doing uh, MMA, I'm cage fighting, I don't think I'd see it as play. I'd be preparing for a very, very serious um, life-threatening fight. But when we spar or when we wrestle or when we do our weapons work in Cobbado, it's really play. Um, and I think if we took it too much more seriously, we might be, I don't know, being a bit self-indulgent. There you are. That's out there, Jeremy. So when I do martial art, that's what keeps me training every day is because it's fun and I pick partners that I really enjoy playing martial arts with and we're very serious in our approach or we're, we're laughing in our approach. And certainly something like Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, which is a fantastic and serious art, if it's not fun, a bunch of guys rolling around each other in a room have got to be having fun together. Wouldn't you think so? To sustain the Absolutely. program and to make it successful. And then we could talk about kids. When we do martial arts with kids, and this is a big mistake, I think, that, that we have in teaching out very serious art and then trying to impart that to children who, face it, learn by play. And, and, and that's a problem in the world. Children learn through supervised and unsupervised play. And so if we can create an environment where children are playing and learning I think we've got it right. And we create an environment where we're teaching rigorous martial arts and traditional Budo theory to children, we'd have it completely wrong. And you'll have a martial arts centered like I had in the 1980s with 50 students that all competed together seriously. But now that we have, a, I guess, an approach that martial arts should be fun and learning should be fun, yet rigorous, you know, we've got 1,500 students in, in five centers. Now, there's a reason for that. And it's not because we're a McDojo. It's because we really understand the nature of kids' play and how they learn. It, it's an interesting conversation because whenever mm. we talk about martial arts, when we talk about what that verb is, it's funny. I've heard a lot of people and they will say, I'm going to go. And then they kind of stumble over the next word. I'm going to go do martial arts. I'm going to practice martial arts. I'm going to train martial arts. And... <laughs> We almost need another word, but as you're talking about it, I mean, you've, you've got me pretty well convinced. Yeah, it's play. Anyone who has ever trained with me, anyone who has ever taken a class with me knows I have fun. I don't care. You know, I'm going to do my best to have fun and make sure that whoever I'm, I'm working with has fun. And if you choose to not have fun because you're taking it too seriously, that's your problem. I'm going to have fun despite you. So well, I'm fully on board with the use of this word play. Now, we can have serious play too, Jeremy. I mean, <clears throat> I've trained with some, um, well, Kovar is a good one. I mean, if you do a session with Dave Kovar, you'll laugh a lot. He's a funny guy, you know, and, uh, and at the same time, if you turned around and trained with uh, 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 the Machado uh, brothers, they are very funny guys. I've trained with Higgin Machado and very, very, let's call it serious martial arts on the mat, but by gee, we laugh a lot because he's a funny guy. <laughs> and uh, I listened to your uh, uh, podcast on, is it Stefan or Stephen uh, Kesting? I love watching his YouTube videos mm. because, again, he trains with a great intelligence, a great sense of humour, very, very serious technique. 
but you can see the guys having fun. And so I'm having fun watching it, want to watch more of it and do more of it because it is. I mean, <clears throat> I don't want to overcook this word because I'm a pretty serious trainer myself and anybody here will say, gee, Brian, you're, you're an intense. My, ma- my wife says, I don't know anyone who trains harder than you, Brian. You're so intense about your martial arts. Well, that's because that's my brand of fun. Um, if you like, my instructor in his broken English, you know, once said, uh, okay, I asked him, could I, could I come and train with you? And he trains outside in Kumamoto on a mountain called Tatsuda Mountain. It's a very strange story. And I asked him once, can I come and train with you the way that you train? That took me a couple of years of this. It's one of those stories, you know, okay, grasshopper, you'll have to wait. And, uh, and finally he said, okay, today let's play martial arts. And then or let's play karate. And, and away he went up the hill to do his training. And I followed madly behind him as he swung through trees, ran through the forest, hung off branches and did the kind of training that he loves to do. That, that uh, <laughs> it was really rigorous, let me tell you, but it was play. So that was, that was a, bit of a bit of an epiphany to me. And that's how this guy gets up and trains every day rigorously um, with, a, with a, a passion, if you like, to try to find the technique of his master who died a long time ago. But if it wasn't fun for him, he wouldn't do it either. So <laughs> I guess that's my thought. As I'm imagining, you know, running through the woods, climbing on trees and just genuinely enjoying that experience, I think we can all imagine that. But if we picture it, it might be difficult to picture an adult. We would typically picture a child engaged in play in that way. And I, I'm i thinking that there's probably some wisdom in that. Because when I think of children, children learn a lot of things relatively quickly and by some pretty tried and true methods of, of mimicry and, and breaking things down simply in trial and error. Mm, and that's exactly right. if we can embody that with the intensity of the play and and the mimicry and and bring that into our martial arts, I would imagine that that keeps people engaged. And you're talking about 1,500 students and and I think you said five schools. And would we see that philosophy incorporated into classes? Well, I sure hope so because a lot of my teacher training is is around that. I mean, it's teaching rigorous technique and, and correct form and so forth. I mean, we have to be rigorous in our training or we don't have a an authentic martial art, but the art of teaching and uh, maintaining attention you know, to create the interest of others is the idea that they're they're engaged and enjoying themselves, and that sounds to me like play, if you like. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, I don't know if you, if I, if I'm over over cooking that term today, but I think you might have hit something, Jeremy. That uh, because I'm thinking as I'm talking that yes, to be able to engage uh, a people and especially children have fun. I mean, go into any successful martial arts centre and you'll see a wonderful atmosphere and a happy atmosphere where students leave, go in excited and leave, leave excited and bubbling about their class. Now that sounds like play to me. They don't go out with frowns on their faces, thinking about the final lessons of, uh, you know, of a uh, <laughs> Budo theory, if you like. They go out saying, "Gee, Mum, that was a great class." And I see Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu guys leave the class, shaking hands, hugging each other, saying, "Good to see you, friend," and uh, I look forward to to rolling with you again, because that's what we do. Because when we roll together, and that's interesting, we build we build camaraderie. We build affection and connection. And even in our sort of a manly warrior way, isn't that exactly what we're doing? And so we continue to train because we think that we're part of a, a community of people who are moving in a, in a, you know, along the same path. And we do that through, through connection. And I think that to me is, is, uh, is a form of play. Hmm. Yeah. 40 years of training, you said. How did that start? <laughs> Where, where's the... Where's the uh, Where's the first day of play? Well, the first day of play, look, I, like a lot of Australian kids, we grew up playing uh, football, and football for us was rugby league or rugby union or Australian rules, and they talk about roughhouse play. Um, it was all rumbling and tumbling and, and, and hard knocks, and I did that for the first 15 years. And I think I started playing football about the age of six when everybody did, 
And in the summertime, you played cricket, which Americans don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> no, we do not. The fascination of cricket, so we won't go there. But, uh, but that's what we did. And then uh, I was at university in the first year, so I started very late. Um, and uh, I was at rugby league training. And I saw all these guys in white pyjamas walk past me. And like everybody else, I snickered a bit looking at these guys. It looked a little bit effeminate, if you might say. We, we call it sissy. And uh, uh, walking past into the, the gym to, to do their training. But I was quietly fascinated. At one, that they had the courage to walk past us wearing their white pyjamas. But also, I thought, what are these guys doing? And I walked into the gym and I sat down and watched some Malaysian guys doing the most, it was Taekwondo, doing fantastic kicks that oh, I've never seen such athleticism. And I thought, wow, I've got to do that. You know, everyone's a closet Bruce Lee, right? So I thought, I've got to try that stuff. And so I enrolled and, uh, and it was enjoyable and it was difficult. And it was something I thought, you know what, this is something I can do because I don't have to wait for anybody else I just turn up to class and train at my pace, if you like, and find my progress. And being a bit fanatic, I'd, I'd uh, go to the park and practice my kicks because I wanted to look just like that Malaysian guy. And uh, it just started something in me that um, I couldn't let go. And uh, when I became a teacher, I got pretty good at Taekwondo. I think I, was, I call it first gup or something. That's one below black belt. And uh, I went off to a country town as a teacher, I went around looking for Taekwondo classes and there weren't any. There was just this karate group. So I went into the karate place and old school, blood on the floor, they all took turns to beat me up. And uh, it, it taught me a great lifelong lesson that one, that's not how you do it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I remember going home thinking, well, you know, with respect to Taekwondo, it wasn't working for me. And, uh, I, but I need to now face this new monster. And that's this karate class that, uh, that scares the heck out of me. And I trained there for another three years and you know, came back to another town about five hours away, no karate. It was a fairly small organisation. And um, I just trained and trained and trained and finally challenged my black belt and thought, you know what, I don't want to do it the way they did it. I've got to find my way to do it because, boy, that was scary. Because for every person that came in and got that, another hundred would have walked out the door going, that's not for me. And... Uh, it was really interesting because we would spar and every night, like big brother syndrome, these guys would beat me up one after the other. And if I thought, well, I'm going to be stronger than that, I'm going to come back and hit them harder and see what happens. Well, if I did that like a big brother, they this just hit you harder again. So it wasn't until I got away, you know, about six months later, I went back to compete in, a, in our club tournament and I beat all these guys. And that was another big lesson for me because I realised sometimes you've got to go away get your perspective, find out who you are and what your possibility is and then come back and have another go. And I never looked back. And I went from there to, you know, opening a dojo and, you know, competing like crazy and, you know, the, the, the story went on and uh, became a wonderful, a wonderful um, passion. You know, I was, a, I was a competition fanatic for about 15 years. So, uh, you know, I, I really got into that. And it wasn't so much because I was so great at it, it's because I couldn't, I couldn't stop doing it. You know, I was a bit of a junkie for it. And, uh, you know, the, it's interesting, before you compete, and, and there wasn't a single competition in 15 years, it would be hundreds and hundreds of bouts, full contact and light contact, or, you know, the Olympic karate style, that uh, I wouldn't, just before the match, want to go to the toilet really badly and question and be shaking and uh, be questioning what the heck I'm doing there and why didn't I just go surfing instead of do this because this is too darn hard. And as soon as the referee says, Hajime, then all of that, you know, goes into the, the package that's you on the map. And, uh, you know, you become a bit of a junkie for that kind of thing. Now, you, you kind of glossed over something that I suspect <laughs> is important. You mm. went away for six months, came back, and were beating all these guys. Mm. What did you do during that six months? <laughs> oh, trained like trained like a fanatic. <laughs> yeah, but you course. weren't training fanatically oh, no. before. I got the sense that you were pretty dedicated. Well, I think so, but um, I think being able to go away and train on your own terms and then come back and take a chance. Like if I came back in a competition and had a go at these guys, it's just a competition. It's three minutes. You know, it's uh, if you like, 
and uh, three minutes of misery rather than uh, the whole night. And it gave me a chance to, to really, um, I don't know, to, to really uh, uh, liberate my own technique, if you like. It's not a big story, I guess, in that it, was, it informed me a little bit, but it really tells me, I suppose, and I don't know if those guys are ever listening because I respect them, but uh, how not to run a club. You know, and, and when I got to the end of my competition life and started looking, being a bit more serious about developing our club, that was one of the thoughts I had, that I don't really want to do that to anybody else. I want our martial arts to be inclusive because I think all those people that turned away at the door, they're the ones that really need to train. I mean, I'm okay, but what about, what about the kid with autism or the kid with you know, ADHD or the mum or the dad? lack confidence or parenting skills or relationship skills, I really need to make place for them too. And, uh, and that's probably what really informed a massive change in the way that we run our groups up here. And I suppose it explains why, why we have a lot of students and why martial arts is proliferating in the world because, darn it, it's hard. So why do people continue to take up martial arts? Because they, they see a glimpse of that stuff. Well, we've got to offer it. And so we try to create a welcoming atmosphere. And if a student is a bit like me, then I need to create a pathway for them. That is rigorous and tough, but it's not for everybody. And the, the time period, at least from the stories that I've heard, because I, I wasn't around, at least not really consciously, with what was going on in the martial arts world back then, but it sounds like you were a bit ahead of your time with how you approached the accessibility of people coming in. You know, we've heard a lot of stories from guests over the years talking about how the pride from the instructor or in the instructor seemed to be around how difficult they could make the class, how hard the students had to work simply to, to show up. We've heard stories about students having to find schools without signs. You know, the, the, the door was on the back and, and there wasn't even a sign. You had to, I always imagine, you know, people just <laughs> crawling through and climbing over and, and finding this, you know, what we might think is this mystical oracle of a martial artist. And it's a regular old class. But the instructors, some of them back in the, in the 60s and 70s, took a lot of pride in making it hard to find and hard to do. I know, isn't that funny to be like finding a finding a martial arts teacher is about as you know, the same as finding a drug dealer or something. You know, so <laughs> somebody whispers. I think down it was there. harder. I, I get the sense it was a lot harder, at least based on you know yeah. the uh, the movies and the music that came out of the sixties. <laughs> well, that's right, and the and and the myth of that. I saw Bruce Lee, and of course, I think I was about fifteen when I saw. Um, the Way of the Dragon. I'll never forget that because we've got the great poster of Bruce Lee in a white singlet holding nunchucks. And uh, that's the one where he fought Chuck Norris. And I think, that, you know, going home trying to kick letterboxes off their stands and do what other silly people do at that age. And so it probably <coughs> prompted a thought. <clears throat> but I thought, this is all very secretive stuff, you know. Where, people, where do people do, do martial arts? And, um, yeah, I, I think it really, really hit it there. And uh, I remember an instructor saying, you realise, Brian, that, um, you know, not even one in a hundred people are going to get their black belt. So if you get your black belt, you're a special kind of guy. And I thought, that's a funny thought, you know, I'm a teacher. So before I'm a martial artist, I'm a teacher. I've been a teacher, you know, since 1980. That's what I do. And so I thought, that's not how you teach. You, you teach to say, welcome, everybody. The doors are open. Come in. You can do this. So I think I went to the state some years ago and my wife and I said, we're going to do this full time. We're going to go and look at the best centers in the U.S. and see what they do that we don't do. And I saw these signs everywhere saying, we are a black belt school. I thought, what does that mean? We are a black belt school. I thought, well, yeah, I know what it means. It means it means we teach the principles and the rigor of a black belt, but also what I take out of it is I'm going to take you and support you all the way to black belt, however long that takes you to get. That's my take. And beyond black belt. And so when you step in here, when I say we are a black belt school, then we're not going to, we're never, while well, you come in here, if you don't give up on us, we're never going to give up on you. 
And boy, oh boy, that's been the truth. You could say it takes four years to get a black belt. No, it takes some people 10. It takes some people 20. You know, I've got a guy with me that's a second degree that's been with me now for 35 years. <laughs> and he just keeps on showing up. And uh, because he feels he belongs and it's an inclusive place and you can't kick higher than your knee anymore because of arthritis and a deteriorating hip and so forth, but that never stops him from coming because he knows that it's not important. What's important is that he keeps going. Now, that's a big difference to the way that we saw it in the 70s, I think, when we thought we were a special esoteric little group of people sneaking around the, you know, the, the back alleys, if you like. And, and as you know, in the States, it's changed massively because now we teach in professional studios and we've moved from the, you know, the, the smash repair back blocks, if you like, to, um, to upmarket um, uh, venues. So martial arts has transformed. And I watched that happen in, here in Australia. I mean, I, I think I was one of the first, I know it was the first person in Newcastle. Newcastle's a large city on the east coast north of Sydney with about, well, you know, a greater area. We've got about six or 700,000 people. So it's a great capacity for building martial arts schools. But there were no full-time centres. And in 19, gosh, 89 or something, I rented an old picture theatre and we had to level the floor out because it was still at an angle. So all of our students came and climbed. We got under the building and we changed the foundation. We lowered the floor. We made it sort of flat. And and, uh, we rented this old building out and ran our first full-time martial arts centre. We had no idea how to do it. Oh, gosh. And we made... We made every mistake that you could make in trying to run a full-time centre, but darn it, we did it. And uh, because we wanted to make it inclusive and have a place where people could park their car, get out, walk into a studio, had a nice sign that says, welcome to our martial arts centre. So (laughs) there's been a a big change, but there's been other wonderful people around me in the industry, a handful at the start and then increasing now to develop martial arts into something that is... um, that, that is respectable and inclusive. When did you know you wanted to teach? Or oh, teach anything or teach martial arts? Teach martial arts. Um, well, it happened by accident. When I moved back to uh, the school I was in in Newcastle as a, as a brown belt in karate, it was a disadvantaged school. Kids were pretty tough. And one student said to me, oh, sir, I see you do karate. I heard you do karate. Yes, that's right. Well, teach us. And I thought, I don't want to teach you. I I teach history and English. No, no, no. We need to learn something. We've got nothing to do after school. So this wonderful story. So I said, well, well, who else is interested in all this? He said, I'll let you know. And uh, all these kids said, yes, we'd like to do something after school. So we went up to the community hall and said, well, can we have an hour here once a week or twice a week to do to do karate training, and that's how it started. Um, there was such a desire from people to do it. Next thing, most of them were my students, but my English and history students. <laughs> Next thing, uh, you know, I've got 20 or 30 or 40 people in the class, and away we go. So uh, it, it's sort of back to front, you know, not, not, not teach you how to teach and then open a centre. It was I opened a centre and worked out how to do it. And my, my wife makes a joke and said, most people go, you know, ready, is it ready? aim, fire, but I always go ready, fire, aim. And <laughs> so I say, we're, we're going to do this. And they go, what are we going to do it? We're going to do it Monday. And my staff will go, what? We're not ready. And I say, well, you will be because we're doing it on Monday. And then I've got to work out how to make it happen. <laughs> and, uh, and that's probably the way I've, uh, I've pretty much always done things because I let enthusiasm go first, you know, for fear of losing it. Yeah. yeah. Now, you've mentioned your wife a couple times, and I get the sense from the context that she also trains and maybe is part of these schools. Oh, you know, I've lived for a long time, Jeremy. So um, uh, I think I was going through a divorce and uh, lost and lonely and throwing myself into martial arts, which is a good story too. You know, I went through a separation when I was 27, and I thought, what am I going to do with myself? What do I do with myself? And I thought in my desperation and angst, I jumped on a plane and went to Japan. And it started a journey, you know, a marvellous journey in my life. And then um, I'm doing a style called Chito Ryu. And uh, it's a pretty, uh, uh, I don't know, esoteric little style that's really big in the, uh, around Kumamoto, um, where the founder had left 
left Okinawa in the 20s and never came back. And uh, there's something good about that because uh, the family and the art survived uh, the war, if you like, and uh, their background's kind of intact. So when you go and start doing this, you say, oh, this is interesting. This is a combination of nahate and shurite. If you do karate, you know, I didn't know people did it together. and said, well, before there was nahate and shurite, there was just this. And somehow I found my way into that kind of style. I'm very excited about it. But it was really big in Canada. So we had a, a group. Um, a, a world championship and I went over to Canada and there was this lovely lady who, who uh, I thought, gee, if I could find somebody to be like that, you know, and, uh, and I, she was with somebody, figures, doesn't it? And then I came back and then I was with somebody and she was with somebody. We had a great friendship going for years and finally in 1992 I was asked to run our world championships in our style and uh, that meant about, you know, two or 300 Japanese people were going to come over and I thought, I can't speak Japanese for nuts. So I called my friend in Vancouver and said, what are you doing? And she said, oh, nothing much. Uh, I said, would you like to come and translate for me for this, this tournament I'm doing? Oh, okay. And she came out. So uh, I've been with her since 1992. I, st- I tell her, I, I stole her passport and didn't let her back. And uh, she was on the Canadian team and I was on the Australian team. So we were, we were both loving our martial arts journey. And, and then she saw I was this crazy competition fanatics who thought, well, I'll do this too. So they allowed her onto the New South Wales team, illegally, I might say, because she was Canadian, so she didn't qualify. But we uh, slipped her into the New South Wales team. And so we had this wonderful journey for the next few years competing together. And uh, it was just fantastic. And she she was a teacher. She'd also um, uh, she gave up teaching before me to help run our fledgling and uh, – a martial arts centre that was headed headed for broke really fast, I might add. So she thought that she'd better uh, look after this. And then uh, when I took a year off, I got to be a vice principal, so I was pretty full on, and uh, said, look, let's take a year off and get some perspective. I said, well, if we're going to do that, let's see what the best is. And that's when we made the decision, about 2005 or three or something, to go to the US and look at all the best martial arts centres and see what we could do and come up with a business plan that did not compromise our enormous love of our art. So I'm just one lucky person, Jeremy, because we do it together. Our kids grew up in in the dojo. They're now teaching. My daughters are all on the New South Wales karate team. You know, they go to Okinawa with me training, and they're now teaching classes. And I'm already looking at the next generation. So my wife and I are trying to step back a bit and watch our daughters do their thing and they are fantastic. So, you know, I'm lucky. It's an idea the family, you know, well, I say the family that kicks together, sticks together if you like, but gee, I've been blessed to be able to do this because we couldn't have done this journey if we weren't doing it together. You know, we talk about, uh, we talk about karate widows. It's a bit of a joke. A lot of guys love to train and their wives are sitting home going, why aren't you ever with me or the training? They're not understanding the... The journey he's on, but when you can do it together, oh my, it's a it's a good run. How has training enhanced your relationship with your wife? Gee, <laughs> apart from again, I'll go back to play again, Jeremy. Okay. Um, the the idea that you with Jet, you, you're doing the same things and. Uh, you know, on the floor looking across at each other, and this is a good thing because here we are, here we are doing the same thing. And I guess it's challenging. And anybody who goes into business together, you got to know when do you when do you clock off. So you know, it could be eleven o'clock at night. And you're still talking about the retention rates and students on hold and this parent's doing that and that parent's doing that. And we're going just a minute, stop. What are we doing? So it's uh, it, it's pretty hard to clock off, but I think the benefits far outweigh. Um, the challenges, the, I could not have done, you know, what I've done in martial arts if I didn't have her support because it means a long time away and a lot, and a lot of time training uh, by yourself. We don't train together and we worked out a while ago that we probably need to find our own training pace, but we're both doing it. But, um, you know, she, she comes, of course, to all the black belt classes and as part of, of, of leadership, she's Shihan in the dojo. But that doesn't mean that we're throwing each other out the back. It might be uh, be asking a bit. So we find our we find our own training pace and our routine, but come together often. So yeah, it's been it's been fantastic for my development. But more than anything, I suppose for me to be able to explore my possibility with with somebody's wholehearted support. How lucky am I? Sounds like 
pretty darn lucky. Yeah. <laughs> She's not listening either, man. <laughs> <laughs> not right now. Maybe I bet she will later. <laughs> yeah. Now I I wonder there there's something I'm hearing that might be worth digging into. And I don't I don't know. You talked about when the school wasn't doing so well. Let's take mm-hmm. a step back and get some perspective. And you used that word and that idea when you talked about going from taekwondo to karate and it not working out you you not being able to it sounded like in in your mind perform at the level that you wanted to so you took some time you took six months and you gained some perspective which i'll be honest that stepping back seems almost contradictory to the way you've described yourself as being a ready fire aim sort of person yeah i didn't step back from anything i guess i call it it would be my wife said gee you're a fighter you run, you run to conflict. And <clears throat> well, stepping back means stepping aside or stepping to the side, stepping to another direction. I'll tell you what happened when, when she came out in 92 and uh, I was uh, running this fledgling full-time martial arts centre when uh, we didn't know anything about billing. We had people paying $2 or something at the door. It was crazy. So, you know, a, a great idea with no business plan, just passion. I thought, what have I got? The only thing I've got is is tenacity. And I thought that that's that's if anybody asks, Brian, why are you successful? Because I hang on by my fingernails when other people let go. And you know, she said, How are you running this place? Well, I was earning my teaching uh, salary, and half my teaching salary was going to paying rent for this full time dojo. But why are you doing that? Because I have a dream that this is going to work one day. Well, it's sure as heck not working now (laughs) because I'm down at the supermarket with a calculator, you know, sort of take that back, take that back. You can't afford that. And it was like that. And when people look at success, I think you've got to have a look at where you came from because we were dirt poor. And she came out and had a look and said, I can see enormous potential in this. I like this tenacity, this idea that you never give up. Uh, But she could help me with some good sense and a business plan. She has a degree in international finance, so there you go. I really married up, Jeremy. But, um, <laughs> you know, and um, yeah, so so I, I was really lucky, and I thought, you got to remember where you came from and those hard years. And the same as, I think the same as developing uh, a deep skill in martial arts. I say to students, there are two or three of us, I think, who have a particular standard in my group that the others don't seem to be able to get near and I think, why is that? And I thought, because it doesn't matter whether it's surfing, my other passion, we can talk about that, or um, playing a guitar or doing martial arts. You've got to have those years where you do the crazy training. And that's where you train so much that you go beyond the norm, if you like. And if you do that, and I think a lot of your podcasts would be talking to experts who at some time in their life, they did that crazy training that gave them that breakthrough that made them special that led towards a type of mastery if you like and uh i suppose the attitude there again is tenacity something fuels them that says i'm not giving up i'm going to do more and then i'm going to do more and then i'm going to do more again you know and i guess it's that attitude i had in martial arts that, that gave me some abilities in martial arts and in competition but also in business that says no matter how hard it gets you never give up and it also that stepping away, not stepping back, stepping aside is probably the right thing to get perspective. I mean, right now we've got to go through this. We're all got to reinvent the way that we teach martial arts right now, or our centres are all going to close down in the next few weeks. Um, you know, be because of the virus we have. And so instead of saying, "Well, I'm going to work this new training app out or this online training system out in three months, three years," no, you've got to work it out in three days. And so that requires, again, a certain amount of tenacity or grit, but also the ability to step to the side and say, we've got a crisis. What are we going to do with that crisis? Well, we better come up with a solution or we'll just go under. And that's probably been my attitude all my life. Did that answer your question at all? (laughs) Or did I digress? The questions I ask don't matter. It's just to to get answers. I don't always know. I don't I don't know what I'm looking for when I ask. I just follow my gut and my gut told me there was something there, and there was. 
Let's talk about surfing. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And, well, have you and the reason I want to talk about surfing, not just because you brought it up, but because I know enough about surfing and I have friends who surf and I don't know too many people who surf casually. Surfing is something that you do or you don't. That's exactly right. I'll give you and one good example. You could say yeah. a bit of the same about martial arts. So my my gut tells me that we're going to find out some some more stuff about you and martial arts as we talk about surfing. So let's go there. Well, you know, it, uh, I guess a good way to introduce it is um, it, my daughters all surf. And whenever I go and do my resilience workshops, we do a bit of get in a circle and say, what do you love? And every time, I don't say I love martial arts, I love my family. I say, I love surfing with my daughters. It's the thing that gives me the greatest joy in the world. And, uh, and there's a reason for that. It's because there, are, there we all are sitting out beyond the breakers, if you like, in a, in a, in a fantastic symbiosis, if you like, that's uh, connected by the water and by nature. And uh, you know, I invested those years, apart from martial arts, to teach my children how to surf. And um, they sometimes my daughters are now 21, 19, 16. And I'll say, hey, you're traveling. And one of them will look at me and go, I'm not doing too well, Dad. What's up? Look, I just need to surf, okay? And so they know that things might not be right in their life, but to settle their ship, ship, S-H-I-P, to settle their ship, they just need to go surfing and get their balance back. It's very similar to martial arts. It's that wa, that harmony, that connection between body, mind, heart, and spirit, you know, that you get from surfing that you also get from rigorous physical training like martial arts. And so there's a real close connection to them. And neither martial arts nor surfing are pastimes or hobbies. I say that to kids, minimum training time with us when you first join up, the only contract we ever have is the first one. And that's six months and there's a reason for that because I don't want to waste their time. I say we're here for six months because after six months, you'll see whether this is something you want to do to black belt or not, but I'll have made significant changes in you or your child and you'll be able to assess it better because martial arts is not a hobby. Martial arts is a way of life. It's a program that's going to change you. So that's my take on it. And surfing does that for me too. So there's two things in my life, I guess, when, you know, when one escapes from the other, if you like, but it's a, it's a marvellous it's a marvelous uh, experience to be living on the east coast of New South Wales and be able to train, you know, and then hop in your car and 10 minutes away you're in the water surfing. So we are, we are quite blessed here. Mm. Your worst injuries, martial arts or surfing? Well, lately surfing, but a little, <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing some crazy things. I guess I, you know, I, I go to Indonesia surfing, and they're pretty nasty coral reefs. So I got a few really good, really good tattoos from surfing. Let me tell you, um, from being hauled across reefs. But that's my fault for being uh, for being an old guy trying to surf like young guys do. Um, but no, I've had plenty of really serious injuries in martial arts, you know, I've had ACL injuries and medial ligament tears and most of them occurred later in my life. I tell you, you know, I decided to go kickboxing. I thought, I don't know enough about kickboxing. So, you know, at the age of uh, 55, I, I made five trips to Thailand doing some pretty serious kickboxing. When you're in the ring with, uh, uh, you know, other young guys and you take a chance. So, you know, I really tore my medial ligament badly and these things gave me a wake up and I've had a, I've had a, injuries to my hip and a, a hip resurfacing but I thought that I wouldn't be able to do karate and I wouldn't be able to surf again about the age of 58 but now I'm back wrestling training and surfing so I'm really lucky that I live in a modern age but yeah the injury is really mounted up but I think I take the philosophy you've got to keep moving because I watch people around me who stop because of injuries they have and uh, they just never get going again so my trick right now is, and you know, until further notice, is, is just don't stop moving. Keep on moving and keep your, keep your joints, you know, greased, if you like, and uh, well, well lubricated, and you'll probably be all right. So still 62 in a few days, and I'm still surfing and still doing martial arts and still doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu and still doing Kogodo and, and loving it all. So it's, uh, and I, I thought, should I slow down? No, I don't think so, because these are the things I love doing. 
And uh, yeah, so yeah, if that answered that that question, it does. Mm. It does yeah, yeah. It, you know, we, the guests that we have on who keep going, who seem to, at least in some sense, defy normal aging patterns or, or normal life patterns. They all seem to have this, what I call uh, a white belt philosophy. You know, here, you, you just told us about three other things that you said, you know, I'm going I'm to go learn how to do this. I'm going to go learn how to do that. I didn't know much about this, so I'm going to go do that. You know, did you say 55? You're stepping into the ring for a, well, for a yeah. tie fight? Well, no, not for a type. Well, in, in okay. training, when I went to Thailand training and they put me in the beginners when they said, okay, you go up to the intermediate, okay, you go up to the uh, fighters ring and train. I thought, you're kidding me, man. I'm, you know, I'm 55, 58 or whatever. Next thing, I'm in the fighters ring sparring these guys. But, uh, you know, it was all right. It was fun. <laughs> I would still imagine that the sparring matches in that context are uh... – a bit more intense than what most of us experience within a dojo. Oh, you know, they're, absolutely. they're they're hitting. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But but that's okay. <laughs> I uh, I I really enjoy training training that hard if the body can do it. But you've got to be careful, you know, and uh, and try to try to be, be kinder to your body. But you know, I don't want to stop. I've decided I'm taking up kite surfing this year, Jeremy. So wow. Oh, cool. Gotta, you got to got to keep doing your stuff. Yeah. Keep playing. Here yeah, it is. I mean, well, there's, there's that, you know, I'm, I'm getting that sense that that's how you approach everything. Is that, is that fair to say? Uh, I don't know if others would hear that say, gee, you're an intense person. I take everything okay. very, very seriously. But for me, fun, the fun is in going hard. And I think a lot of listeners would agree that the fun we get is in, is in feeling ourselves doing the very best we can and wringing the best out of our bodies or our minds. And that's when we're having fun because that's when we're on fire. We're lit up. Sounds like Top Gun here, doesn't it? Um, but uh, there's something else here too. When you get older, the, the importance of still continuing to train is you haven't really peach, reached a peak in your possibility because, you know, martial arts is hard and soft. And if you're looking at development of, of all of your body's potential, I think it comes much later when your testosterone hopefully gets a little bit less. And instead of hard power to do everything, you start to look for soft power and soft power and internal power. And I think all your listeners understand this, particularly those that do the Kung Fu and Tai Chi and so forth and understand the importance of soft power or internal power. For someone that's doing hard power all his life, the next thing I find by acceptance, and this is a really important one, by acceptance of self and letting go, you relax. And when you relax, all of a sudden you find power you never had before. So it's interesting that every time I had a serious injury, my instructor, wise and strange and uh, uh, eccentric kind of a guy that not many people could follow, but I do because I, I get him and, uh, and I forgive his differences. But every time something happens to me and I think, Sensei, I don't know if I can do this anymore. He'll go, that injury is really good for you because you learn something. When, you, when your hip is no good, you will learn soft power. You know, when, you, when your shoulder is no good, you have to find the power from your center and you'll find things you never found before. So talk about a guy who keeps turning, you know, uh, uh, making lemonade out of lemons because, uh, you know, every time something happens, he sees a possibility to explore another concept in your body. And isn't that a beautiful thing? So that as we get older, as we get older, we can truly find the potential in our bodies that we left out before because of doubt or ambition or, or um, you know, or, or too much determination. But as we find acceptance in self and start to relax a little bit, and then we find we can do amazing things. So look, I hit harder now than I did when I was thirty-five. Let me tell you, and uh, and it comes from it comes from relaxation and integration of all those energies and a connection, the connection between mind and body. And, uh, and that's the thing because when you're young, it's all body. But as you, as you allow your mind in and you find the connection between mind and body, I think you really get it. Let's look forward. Mm. You mentioned kite surfing, but what else is coming down the pipe for you? What are you looking forward to? <laughs> what are your goals? What are you hoping for? Look, I suppose at my age, we've been doing it for a while. As I said, we've built it up into five 
martial arts centres and, you know, I look at what's the next thing. Uh, the, the next thing, of course, you know, I talk about martial arts and, and, and our business is trying to build something that's sustainable without us. Now, that's what everybody wants to do, you know, if they've been doing this for a long time. And I'm lucky that I have daughters doing it, but there's no guarantee that they'll do it full time. They're going to find their way too. And by the time they find their way and come back to it, I might be too old. I don't know what will be there. I've really got to build a system that can take care of itself. And that means building a leadership team from the bottom to the top. So that's my fascination right now is teaching teachers. You know, you've got to look at when it's time to step back and see what kind of team that you've got around you. And so at our centres, leadership is the biggest deal. You know, we have volunteers at the bottom. We have kids at eight doing doing little kids' leadership and we have teenagers doing bigger kids' leadership. We have adults doing leadership of how to you know, lead the teens and so forth. And then we've got volunteers and we've got part-time instructors and we've got team leaders. And building a system where if I'm not there, if I'm nothing but a picture on the wall, the system sustains itself. That's 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 my challenge now with the number of students we have and and the size that we have. And to do that, I need energy, but relaxed energy to do it. And that means probably a little less time teaching classes and a little bit more time watching teachers and, um, and giving them feedback. So I'm excited about that, but it also means more time for myself to explore other things that I might like to do, whether it's surfing or kite surfing or going back to windsurfing or doing things for, uh, for fun. Again, I play is a big thing, isn't it? I want to come back to that uh, in your older age. But, uh, but no, building a really successful centre that has a legacy, I think, is, is really what I want to do. I imagine that the school owners that are listening are, mm. are hearing your numbers and saying, wow, these, that's really impressive. And I'm not going to ask you to share everything or, or even oh, anything think- in particular, but would you offer one tidbit? You know, what's, what's one thing that, that you found really transformational for what you were offering? Well, if I can, if you can indulge me, I'd offer a few. By all means, please. Uh, if, I, if you wanted a 10-step plan, I guess, to, <laughs> to success, and a lot of people would say that, I'd say the most important thing, if you want to build a really successful dojo, is first and foremost, you've got to be a martial artist. And you've got to be a serious martial artist. And so you've got to love what you do because charisma is nothing but your passion coming out. And if you've got passion, then people will catch some of that. They, they, they want some of that. And you get that because you're a martial artist. And so you've got to do your own training. And that's the hardest thing for my full-time teachers to do because they didn't do the hard years that I did that fueled that ability, if you like, or that passion to see, to see the big picture. So I think the first and most important thing is you've got to love martial arts and you've got to be passionate about your training, and then you can build a good group around you. And I think the other thing that's really important is you can't do it by yourself, is model great people. Now, I've got to say, there are people in this country, and I think one who really needs to be interviewed is uh, Kiyoshi Liz Marla on the Central Coast, because when I was talking about getting martial arts centres going, she was doing it at the same time, maybe even slightly before, and there were times when I'd watch this lady who lives about 100 kilometres from me. You know, I thought, hang on buy her coattails and you're going to go somewhere because she really understands how to do it. She's another great competitor who's built a a fantastic system network of martial arts centres. Well, I watch people like that and say, what can I draw from that? And that'll save me years of individual thinking. So sometimes I say, and that's what teachers do, flog great ideas from other people until you don't need that idea, until you morphed it into your own idea, and then go flog another idea. So you've, you've really got to model great people. And I think the third thing is really get your systems in shape, in top shape, and so that you have a really good system from, I say, from the door to the floor and back again and get it right. And that sometimes means subscribing to other systems that have done it better than you until you can invent your own. Like we invent our own, you know, computer systems or whatever, or we, you know, and uh, um, uh, customer relations software, we might, we might move around, but we are able to do this ourselves. Uh, but at the start, no, we just bought into other people's. And I, I think the other thing about a point four would be you've got to inspect what you, ins- what you expect and then inspect it again and then inspect it again. And so I say, well, I want this teacher to teach a class. I've got to see what that teacher's doing. 
and keep checking and giving some feedback so that that person is so that doesn't matter where you are in one of our five centres, you think you're in the same place, and that's really important. And that's branding. But the other thing that's really important for us is we bought most of our buildings. So I'd always say, if you want to be successful in martial arts, as you get tired, you might have to change um, your uh, the way you spend your time. But if you bought your martial arts building, then you built yourself your own legacy so that when you're tired or hurt, you've got an investment there. So we figured early on, we made us really sick to the stomach, paying lots of rent um, for things rather than that we could have been paying to ourselves. So we are so lucky now that we bought uh, three of our properties and we rent two of them. We'll probably buy some more. And, and I think that's been the best thing we've done because every time we bought a building, we'd say that mortgage rate's really high. But after three or four years, it was less than the rent we would have paid as rent kept coming up. So it was every single time we did it was a great investment. You know, and I, 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 think, I think another really important thing about apart from building a really good curriculum, you know, and you've got to evolve it, uh, that curriculum. But you need to build a curriculum that's inclusive, that allows everybody to get somewhere. So you can allow the good to be great, you know, and, and, and the, the people not travelling well to travel a lot better. So I think that's really important. Um, that might cover it, you know. The other thing that's I tough. think, is, yeah, is be, be prepared to reinvent yourself. Uh, so the business we have now is very different to the business we had 10 years ago and different to the one we had 20 years ago. You barely recognise them. So you know, I think it's terrifically important to get the lay of the land, look around, feel the market and say, yeah, if I'm self-indulgent and say my martial arts is so important, you should all come do it, then you'll always have 30 or 40 students. And if that's what you want to be, if you want to be a great competitor and have the reputation for being the most competitive club around, you always have a small club and good luck to you because that's what you want. But when you want to be a successful business, you've got to open the doors and think a little bit wider. And that means sometimes reinventing yourself or even getting a third party to take a look because sometimes the biggest impediment to growing a martial arts centre is the chief instructor himself or herself because they're so full of their idea of, of what important martial arts should be that they forget that you also got to make a successful business. And that might be... Another important point, Jeremy, and that is when it comes to business, I have to say when we changed to make our business more modern, I had some dogfights with consultants who would come in and say we want to change and I'd say, well, get on your bandwagon because you don't do real martial arts, you don't know what you're talking about, you know, till I, I realised that that just that just doesn't cut it. Sometimes a third party has got to tell you, you know, um, <clears throat> how to do this. So that means rebranding sometimes and uh, and reevaluating curriculum and reevaluating your your uh, your business approach. And so we've got to be prepared to change, be flexible. So there's a lot there. And the other yeah. one, yeah, and I think, sure. man, the most important one is look to your family because if you don't have mm. a good family to back you, you don't get anywhere. So I've already talked about how blessed and lucky I am, you know, and, and it could have gone the other way. So I'm I'm so lucky. That had family that supported me in doing this, doing this venture. Because if you didn't, then it's a bit of a lonely, it's a pretty lonely path, martial arts, unless you're all in. But we're lucky because at this stage we're all in. So it's been a it's been a, a wonderful journey for us. That's great stuff. Thank if you. If people want to find you, your school, social media, websites, email, any of that, where would they go? Yeah, if listeners are interested in in you know, looking at well, what's our martial arts center look like, sound like, feel like. If you go to, um, it's www.huntermartialarts.com.au, uh, because it's an Australian website. And you can see what we're about and get lots of uh, our intro videos and that kind of stuff and see, okay, how does this place operate? And you get a feel, um, you know, for who we are and and what we're about, and they're most welcome to have a look. And I think it's really important to, to share our best ideas around our martial arts community so that we all prosper together. And it's, it's, yeah, it's interesting too. We didn't, And you know what's really interesting? I thought we'd spend an hour talking about my style of karate, its founder, its teachers, and its techniques. You know what? We've talked for an hour and we haven't even talked about it. And I think that's a healthy thing. And we don't even say, oh, we are www.chutokai.com. Nobody cares. 
Now, people don't say, hey, man, I want to train with you because you do Chitokai martial arts. They don't care. You know, it's that old story. Somebody rings up and says, hey, I'm looking for Taekwondo. Do you do Taekwondo? We go, yeah, yeah, sure we do. It's kind of Japanese Taekwondo, but come and have a look. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, because they don't know what they're looking for. They just want a place where they can belong. And that's what you've got to create. Now, sometimes I think now in the world today, the style is not nearly as important, you know, as, a, as your ability to teach martial arts. So I think that's the bottom line. So it's interesting that we don't talk about styles. We talk about martial arts more generically. Right. And, of course, anybody who's been listening to this show for a while knows that, you know, I, I, I've said many, many times that different styles, I don't care if you're talking about, you know, the most fluid, soft, Tai Chi variant versus, you know, some hyper rigid Okinawan style. They have more in common than they do separating them. Oh, absolutely. I think at the end they kind of look the same. If you saw my kata now that my uh, teacher is teaching, he calls it the Koryu kata, the old kata that were taught before uh, to his uh, his father-in-law. And uh, it's uh, it looks like Kempo. It looks like Tai Chi. And with all we do, Okinawan martial arts, so our, small, our, younger, our, our earlier kata look a little bit more uh, like Shitoryu or even Shotokan, but our senior kata look like Tai Chi. So it's interesting. We'll say many paths lead to the top. I think at the end they all pretty much look the same. And, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting point. Mm. Well, I leave it to the guest for how we go out. You know, there can be some some parting words or uh, final thoughts, you know, whatever whatever you would call it. How do you want to send out your episode here? Oh, man. Oh, you've got me. I love talking, Jeremy, as you can see. I can uh, tell. I can tell. We've had a great conversation. <laughs> yeah, we have. Uh, I don't know if if, uh, if I had something from uh, all of those thoughts that you've given me from watching the first Bruce Lee movie, if you like, to today. You know, I just say enjoy the journey, that martial arts is a – is a fantastic journey and full of full of humor and funny stories and good memories and you've got to make it that so i suppose i take myself very seriously in martial arts but my advice would have been don't take yourself too seriously because and this is the beauty of martial arts and probably why i do it as like i do that you can never no matter how good you think you are you look over your shoulder or to the right or to the left and there's somebody doing it better and it keeps you humble and it gives you good reasons to keep doing it because you can never say you've actually really got it. And so doesn't that make, it's like surfing, and doesn't that make the journey then a marvellous thing to do? I could hang my life on that because I hope that as I go out, I'm still lying in bed or whatever going, how's that car to go again? What's that move? And, uh, you know, so I'm still learning you know, the day I die. And if I do that, it's a life for a lift. We've had a great track record of Australian guests on the show, and it just makes me want to go visit. It's a big country, though, so I'd have to go for a while. And it's in part due to guests like Kyoshi Hayes, who talk about their passion for their art, but their passion for life. When I think about the guests that we've had on the show, Everyone has a passion for their art, but not all of them have such a passion for life. And that's one of the things that I took away from today's conversation. So thank you, sir. I appreciate your time and hope we get to meet and train some point in the near future. Check out WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com for the show notes. Every episode has a page all to itself with links and photos, a transcript, and sometimes even more. If you're up for supporting the work, You've got some choices. Make a purchase at whistlekick.com. And if you do, use the code podcast15. You can also share an episode, leave a review, tell a friend, or contribute to the Patreon. Patreon.com slash whistlekick. Remember, if you see somebody out there wearing some whistlekick stuff, make sure you say hi. There's something growing here, and you're all part of it. Our social media accounts, lots of activity, lots of fun stuff. We put a lot of work into them. And you can find them at whistlekick. If you've got a guest suggestion, I want to hear it. Email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. I appreciate your time today, and I hope you're well. Until the next episode, train hard, smile, and have a great day. 